Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and today we are talking about postpartum mental health. My guests are Lindsay Lipton Gerst, who was drawn to Los Angeles by her passion for art and music and ended up managing some of the biggest artists in the music industry. After stepping back from her career to start her family, Lindsay's postpartum experience led her on a passionate mission to raise awareness about postpartum depression, including producing the documentary film When the Bow Breaks, which has dramatically increased awareness and discussion about postpartum mental health. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. And our other guest is Dr. Alyssa Berlin. She is a perinatal psychologist and doula, working with individuals and couples primarily around pregnancy, postpartum, and parenting. She's developed the Afterbirth Plan. It's a program to help expecting parents prepare for a smoother and healthier transition to parenthood and family growth. She's the best wife a guy can ask for, (laughs) and she's an amazing mother to our four delicious children. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, honey. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Lindsay, I mean, you took a giant shift from what you were doing to what you're currently doing. Um, And it all started around the birth of your child. Can you talk more about what happened there? Yeah, well, I have a history with mental illness. Starting when I was five years old, I had OCD and anxiety, and I was getting treatment for that. But back then in the 70s, there really wasn't, it wasn't spoken about a lot. And so there wasn't, you know, it's like my my treatment was looking at ink blots, and they look like bats. And, you know, so and then as time went on, um, my OCD and anxiety stayed, and I went into a state of depression mm-hmm. to the point when I was 19. I had to quit college at the University of Colorado and move back home, where I spent six months in bed waiting for medication to work. And then I had this dream that I always wanted to work in the music industry. Music was my passion. It's something that I, that I just like. I needed to be in in that world. Mm-hmm. It made me happy. I, I was a writer. I wrote poetry and songs. And so I got to work. Uh, I moved up to California, and I started working in the music industry, and it was a dream come true. Do you play an instrument? I do. I play guitar, but off and on, <laughs> you know, when I have time. Um, so, and, I, and I've always, I always, you know, remained writing. I, I love writing music and, and songs. So when you listen to music, you're connecting with the words, or is I, it just the melody that? When I listen to a song, I hear every sound, um, every lyric, every every little piece of it. I can hear, and I just like it, it's 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 a very spiritual experience for me. Always I'm, has been. Like jealous of that. I listen to a song, and I I know like a, the beat catches me, or the melody catches me, the chorus maybe. But I don't know, if you ask me what the words are, I probably couldn't tell you on most songs. Who the artist is? No way. Yeah, I'll be at a concert. Like we go to lots of concerts, and my nine-year-old son is, loves rock music, so I'm very lucky. So we'll go to a concert together, and I'll have to stop after, while the artist is singing and like write stuff down because it inspires me. Wow. To, yeah. Wow. And I'm jealous of both of you because I'm tone deaf. <laughs> so, but you can still hear I'm it. I'm not even on the plane. Okay, listen, I've been to like a total of three concerts. And you can't even count the first two. So we've been to white. <laughs> <laughs> what were they? What were they? <laughs> uh, we recently went to hear John Legend. Which was amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, that and was amazing. It was so experience. moving. He's so talented. Oh, yeah. And I loved his music. It really... It speaks to you. It really does. So I can appreciate the lyrics from that perspective, and the music yeah. was beautiful. But you do see other people, like, having a religious experience <laughs> at the concert, and you're kind of a little jealous, even before the big thing of wine goes down. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, like, write down quotes from songs I've never heard. Like, if I'm if I'm singing a band live, the last band we saw was Linkin Park for the memorial, Chester Bennington Memorial. Sure. I was so inspired by these artists that were up there. I wrote these quotes down, and I posted them on social media, on my Instagram and Facebook, and I was like, this is powerful. Check this out. And if people, you know, <laughs> think I'm, you know, a little off or if they, you know, some people are like, wow, that's amazing. But it's such this, it's beautiful to me. Sure. If people don't get it, it's their loss. Yeah. But yeah. I could even see kind of, you know, like plastering them in your room and having these beautiful mantras to surround you. Totally. Message yeah. boards. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I just it caught me that you were so passionate about it. And it must have made you a great music manager because you were so into the well, music. I believed in the artist and mm-hmm. I believed in their music and very, I was very honest with the artists I worked with. And we had, you know, some really beautiful relationships because of it. Whereas a lot of people go into 
the industry because they want to be a part of the scene. You know, I was I was there because I loved music. That's really cool. Um, and then when I was 30, I was still in the music industry. And it was a dying industry at the time. We were shifting from, you know, um, CDs to digital. And so, you know, the music industry, you know, didn't have the money anymore and people were losing their jobs. And I was scared. And so I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next just in case, you know, our company was going to close down. Um, But I didn't have to because... um, I wasn't able to work anymore after I had my son. I At 30, I got married. Um, and then five months later, we found out we were pregnant. While I was pregnant, I got very sick with antepartum depression. Um, and do you want to explain what that is, antepartum depression? Antepartum depression is depression while you're pregnant. Right. Um, but I also had anxiety and um, OCD during it as well. And thank you for sharing that because most people assume that postpartum means that it has to happen after the baby's born and they don't realize that most postpartum experiences really do start during pregnancy. Right. Which for me, I wasn't surprised that I got it. I wasn't surprised that I had the anxiety that went along with it. Um, But it was definitely an overwhelming overwhelming experience because like the thoughts that went through my head was like, I can't do this. I need to end this pregnancy. There's no way like I can, I'm not going to be a good mother. I can't be a mother. I'm not ready yet. And so those constant thoughts, and then it started shifting to, I haven't felt the baby move in an hour. I need to go get an ultrasound. And I think I got like 20 ultrasounds while I was pregnant because I was so freaked out mm-hmm. that something was going to go you wrong. Home, home Doppler to listen to the I baby? didn't. I went to my doctor's office in uh, the hospital so many times. Did you know about the home doctor? I did just listen? No, oh, yeah, but one. I probably should have gotten that. <laughs> well, and it sounds like it might have been that double-edged sword. Yeah, it could go either way because then you might never stop listening right. to the baby. I probably would have done it 20 times And a like day. you said, I mean, you you know, when you talk about the fact that you've really known anxiety all your life, it's mm-hmm. not surprising that you experienced it during pregnancy. It sounds, it sounds like the piece of that really surprised you was how hard it hit and how deeply it impacted you. Exactly. And also what it did was it really scared me for when I was going to have my child right. because all those feelings of, you know, growing up and having the horrible anxiety. And I was on medication while I was pregnant. I stayed on my medication. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And and before we started recording, you said, you know, ask away. Mm -hmm. And so if there's anything I ask that you don't want to share or talk about, okay, I I just want to know that you're not on the spot, okay? Because you said you had OCD and anxiety since the time you were five years old. Mm -hmm. So leading up to getting pregnant, were you experiencing anxiousness or OCD or depression then? Since I was five, I never did not have OCD right. or anxiety. How does your your OCD affect you? Because it affects people differently. You know what's interesting about my OCD is that you, when you live with it for so long, it starts to become this normal way that you sure. just are. So it's like, I don't, in a, if a day goes by, I probably had a hundred OCD thoughts, but you don't think about it because you're so used to it. Mm-hmm. So, but if, if, if you do think about it, um, it ranges from foods I can eat, clothes I can wear, restaurants I can go to. Um, if, if I do the things that my mind tells me I can't do, you know, it's like a really fast thought, like, you'll die if you eat this. Okay, you, you know, and, and you move on. And I think when I was younger, it was a lot more um, in my face of the thoughts that I was having. But now it's kind of just the way it is. And was it labeled for you as such when you were younger? You knew back then that it was OCD? I didn't know. My parents knew. And then, in fact, I think I was 12 at the time, and Oprah Winfrey was on, and it was the first time that they spoke about OCD. And and my sister goes, and I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. My sister goes, Mom, OCD, Lindsay. And I heard her, and I go, what? What is that? And then I started doing you know, my own research at 13 years old about OCD, and I found out what it was. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's what that's I have. Yeah. And wow. it's interesting because yeah. I find a lot of clients in my practice will have a similar experience where they've known that they've had anxiety for a long time, if not all their lives, and they always – have figured out ways to incorporate that into their lives and make it work with them. Like you said, it just becomes their new norm. Yeah. Um, Where they'd even give a kind of cutesy names of, okay, so that's me, I'm quirky, I'm anxious. But then to have it labeled, it was a very different experience of, oh, I knew I was anxious, but I didn't know it was OCD. Yeah. I wonder at 13 if finding out what it is is comforting at all 
or is no, it, it wasn't. goes the other way? It right. wasn't. It was kind of awful because you when for somebody so young for me when I had a label to what I was going through, then I knew that there like to me there was something wrong with me. Right. Mm-hmm. And especially, you know, I love my sister. Um, but for her to say, Mom, you know, O C D that made me feel like it was like the secret thing and, you know, like almost like taboo. Right. Do you wish you had known earlier? No, I don't think I would have understood it. Yeah. So I'm kind of glad I did it. It was, in your mind, the right move to not tell you. Yeah. No, I, I think they did the right thing. I mean, I started going to therapy at six. So, sure. you know, I knew that there was something, you know, that I needed help with. I just wasn't sure. When did you start medicating? I started medicating um, before college, so about 18. Hmm. Um my, my my mother, I, w- I was on and off with psychiatrists and psychologists my whole life. And right before I went to college, um, they recommended Prozac. And I was like, I don't need, I don't need medication. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm fine. And so um, I went off of it my freshman year. And um, I had a lot of loss that year. My parents split up and mm-hmm. um, somebody that I was close with passed away. And so after that, I kind of had like this kind of breakdown and things weren't right. And then I was experimenting with drugs, hallucinogenics. And one day I woke up and I was not in a reality. I was not in, it it was not a good, it scared me so bad. It felt like I was on this drug trip that I couldn't get out of. And what it was, was a panic attack. Sure. But it was like, I couldn't get out of it. It was like a week long panic attack. So you think you're going crazy. And, um, you know, my mother flew out and we went to doctor and we just couldn't figure it out. And so I wasn't able to function. So I had to take a leave of absence from school, move back home. And then we realized what it was that I went into this really severe depression with panic disorder. And so I, I had to drop out of school and I was in bed for six months wow. um, while we tried different medications. And then Zoloft started working for me. But what was magical about that was once the Zoloft started working, I felt so good that I wasn't in that pain anymore that I got right back up and I applied to school near home and I finished college. And then that's when I started working in the music industry. Oh, wow. Wow. So really? it kind of sh- changed my course. Tremendously. And and I'm so glad that you're saying that. And I have to say, I've worked again with a number of people who feel like they should be the poster child for Zoloft. Mm-hmm. And the conversation around medication really is changing. And I'm glad that it is because, you know, I'm all for natural and oh, holistic yeah. and clearly a big advocate for therapy. But medication has a very important place in the bigger picture. And now they're recognizing that it's no longer the old conversation of what they thought it was in terms of, you know, picking between exposure versus no exposure. So to exposure to meds versus nothing at all. And now they're recognizing, and especially when it comes to maternal mental health, that you're really distinguishing or deciding between exposure to a medication Mm -hmm. or exposure to an untreated mental illness. Well, yeah. And and, I mean, it's such a good point because like, how amazing would it be if I could recover without medication? Sure. But I couldn't. Right. Some people can. Some people can, but you're in good company right. of where for a lot of people, medication is that piece that makes a big difference. Right. So what happened, though, with the Zoloft is it, it, it kept me stable for quite a few years. And then when I was 23, it stopped working. Hmm. And I, was, I remember I was working at MCA Records and I was meeting with my boss. We were in a meeting and all of a sudden I had the panic attack. Wow. And, and I was, I, you know, I, I didn't know you could relapse. Sure. You know, it's this huge moment where you're just like, but I was fine. And I was also on like around the clock clonopin mm-hmm. mm-hmm. for the anxiety. And so, you know, I was like, well, how am I getting this with this medication in me? I don't understand. You know, I'm, I was stable. Uh, the medication stopped working. Right. So I took a leave of absence from MCA Records. I said I had mono. Oh, wow. Yep. <laughs> because... You know, at 23, so this was 20 years ago, you know, you, you're you starting in the music industry and everything's great. And I don't want to say, you know what, I'm having a panic attack. Right. I suffer from depression and panic disorder. Right. I, you'll get labeled. You'll get labeled. By your right? record label. And I wish that we could say 20 years later, we've moved away from the stigma and that people would be totally embracing and accepting. And maybe we've gotten better. But well, and that's why we're here talking about it. Uh, yeah, you know? exactly. Because there's um, still what to do. Exactly. <laughs> so I said I had mono. 
I went home. Oh, no. I spent a month in bed again, and then Celexa started working for me. Right. Hmm. So I was on Celexa from that moment till after I gave birth to my son. So was there a conversation before pregnancy about what to do with medication? Yeah, I was seeing a psychiatrist throughout my th- before I got pregnant throughout my pregnancy, and um, she decided to retire right before I gave birth. Oh. And so she recommended some uh, man that she knew, and I was like, well, I'm just going to trust her. And right. you know, so the first time I saw this this new guy was um, when I was in really bad shape after I had my son. That's a hard time to be meeting someone new. Something new. Yeah. yeah. But so we did talk about it and, and we had a plan. And um, when I was struggling with antepartum depression, we didn't want to change my medication. We just wanted to, you know, work on it and, and just, you know, watch me. And, um, you know, I made it through. I, I didn't. So you didn't change your meds at all? I didn't. Once you, I the pregnant. pregnancy started? Because the Celexa was safe. Um, you know, mm-hmm. th- people are so scared um, to take depression while pregnant, but I'd rather have that than nothing at all and go, you know, like really not be doing well. So I chose to stay on the medication. Which is a really brave decision. Yeah. And I'm re- I'm so proud of you and I'm happy that you were able to do that. We recently had Amanda Seyfried on mm-hmm. the podcast and she talked about how she didn't stop taking her medication during pregnancy because she also has OCD and yeah. uh, panic attacks and there was a... a the media ran away with it, saying Amanda Seifert took uh, her medication while, you know, her mental health medication mm-hmm. while she was pregnant. And then, you know, respectable news outlets brought in experts to talk about it. And that's like, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Every time a celebrity talks about it, it, it goes huge in the media. I mean, every celebrity that, that has come out with postpartum depression or they suffer from a form of depression, anxiety, OCD, any of that, like Amanda did, you know, the, the media runs away with it. And then, but what it does and why it's so great that they speak out is because it brings the attention that so many people don't get that sure. celebrities do get, and it brings up the conversation that we need to have. Right. Yes, it's okay to be on certain medications while we're pregnant. Yes, it's okay to be on certain medications while we're breastfeeding. Right. This is, you know, you have to make a choice. And right. for some people, it's a very hard choice. For me, it was not. I knew well, that, that was the only choice I had. And I think it's pretty incredible that you're here telling your story. And I know that your story was the basis for this amazing documentary that you produced. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. So... Were you expecting postpartum depression? I did. You were I expecting. knew I was going to get postpartum yeah. depression. Yeah. Well, and especially when it starts during pregnancy, mm-hmm. that's a pretty strong indicator that there's a great likelihood that there will be postpartum. Yeah. You you know, the, the worst I ever had, you know, the depression and the panic was when I was 19 and I had to leave college. I never wanted to have that feeling of not being in control again, sure. you know, where you literally feel like you're going crazy and you don't know if you're ever going to be sane again. Mm-hmm. And after I had my son two days later, I, I went there oh. and it was the scariest moment of my life, you know, because now it's not just about you. Now mm-hmm. you have a family to take care of and there you are not knowing if you can take care of yourself and like what reality you're in. And it's the scariest, it's the scariest thing in the world. Sure, it is, and it sounds like it hit really early on after baby. And you had a your, your psychiatrist was out of the picture. Yes, uh, that was extremely scary because when it hit so hard after I got home from the hospital, and I had a traumatic delivery too, which did not help. And because of my anxiety, I scheduled to be induced because I needed to know when the baby was coming, and you know, like I needed to be in control of something sure. because when you have anxiety, you feel so out of control with mm-hmm. everything. So when it hit, I immediately went to my doctor like you should. And he said, let's try this medication. If this doesn't work, we have plenty of other options. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't have time for plenty of other options. You know, that's not the right thing to say to me. Right. It, it 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 was a really devastating moment. And you share your experience in the film. Yeah, and when the bell breaks. And when the bell breaks. How did the film come to be? The film is kind of like this magical thing that showed up in my life that I'm so grateful for. Um, I was reading this mommy blog uh, 
my son was two at the time. And it said, we want to interview, we're, we're making a documentary about postpartum depression. We want to interview moms that are struggling. And I contacted them and I actually knew Jamie Lynn Littman and Tanya Newbold. They were they came together because Tanya had postpartum depression and Jamie Lynn um, was a director and producer. And so I met them, they interviewed me, and then, and then I hadn't heard from them. And so... I contacted Jamie Lynn like a year later and I was like, what's going on? She's like, oh my God, we need to meet. And she, and so what happened was um, they wanted to bring me on board as producer as well. And then it turned into um, uh, let's share your story in the film because my son was two at the time and I was still not well. And we showed my journey to, you know, through the illness and recovery mm -hmm. and all the treatments I did. And, and we also, you know, we interviewed so many people ranging from the baby blues to postpartum psychosis and everything in between. So we really wanted to educate. And our biggest purpose was for people suffering to know they're not alone. Sure. These are these stories. You're going to relate to one of these stories. And so uh, we made the film. And by the time we finished the film, my son was six. And, and there it was. Well, I just got goosebumps. It is. What a powerful journey. And what was the experience like from a therapeutic perspective for you making the film? Making the film was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> it's like every day when we shot, um, not only my story, but all the interviews we did, you know, I, I, I became so connected to not only the women suffering, but the husbands, the children that we interviewed. It, it was it was so all engulfing and it was so hard, but at the same time we knew what we were doing was something really powerful and that would have a huge impact. And um, when, I, I wanna go back because Brooke Shields is the narrator mm -hmm. and, and uh, along with myself, executive producer. And when she came on board, I knew that what we had was gonna go far because we had this woman that had this, she was a pioneer, Yes, you know, in, in, in talking about postpartum depression and perinatal mood disorders. And she got it out there with her book, Down Came the Rain. And so this is kind of like the next step that's out there. Like people can see, you know, what, what this illness does and, and the stories. And it's it, it, making the film, although it was the hardest thing I ever did, did save my life. So it was your therapy. It was my therapy. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of like my second baby, <laughs> Sure. you know, and, and I'm, I'm always going to talk about it because I have, I feel like I have this responsibility now that it's out there and I share my story and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm this face of maternal mental illness and, um, I, I, I just don't want to stop. I want to keep going and help more people. How's the film been received? Really wonderful. I'm yeah. actually sitting here trying very hard not to spoil the ending yeah. because the whole movie is just so powerful Thank and you. so moving um, and really does a beautiful job of, like you said, portraying the gamut. Yeah. Um, I mean, you definitely have a number of more severe cases mm -hmm. than I think the typical normal oh, yeah. face of depression. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I mean, I imagine that people who are watching it will be able to connect with one of the different women in that story, if not multiple ones. Yeah, since the film's release, which was um, in May, um, it, it was released on Netflix. Um, it's also on iTunes and on most um, video on demand platforms. It's in over 70 countries now. Wow. Congratulations. Thank Lindsay. you. So, so, um, and I am the person behind the Facebook page and the Instagram. So anybody that writes on that page will hear from me and you know, in the film, I say, I don't care if there's one person on our Facebook page or 10,000 people on the Facebook page, I'm still going to be there replying to people. Because the the power of knowing you're not alone and you're not crazy is so huge in, in getting help and getting treatment. It, it's, I hear literally every day I hear from, from new moms struggling that sure. have watched the film and say, that person was talking about my story. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's what I went through. Especially the intrusive thoughts, because we don't we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to be seen as crazy mom. Sure. Because of the stigma attached to it. Right, and I think that's where the field is doing a really good job in terms of providing better education. Yeah. Where we used to think postpartum, you know, was only depression, yeah. and we didn't even recognize initially that it would look more anxious than depressed. And now we're also recognizing that you know, postpartum bipolar, postpartum mm -hmm. OCD 
are also anxiety. very common experiences, mm-hmm. anxiety, psychosis, depression, Everything. which is why now the new term is perinatal mood and anxiety mm-hmm. disorders. We know it can start during pregnancy, mm-hmm. and we know it looks a lot of different ways besides just depression. Exactly. And, you know, all the stuff from like a history with depression, you know, there, there's so many things that can lead to it. Right. it it's 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 powerful because there's so many people working so hard and so many advocates working so hard in this field, and I'm just grateful to be a part of that. and And I hope the film, you know, gives a good insight to what to look out for. You know, sure. we we show we show some really scary things in there. You know, the psychosis stories are are hard to watch, and you know they can be triggering. But there's a reason for that. We need to educate. Sure, absolutely. And it does. It does a wonderful job. And I know you have some amazing experts in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, portraying that and sharing that very valuable information. And I'm with you. There's one thing to be able to read it. There's something very different and powerful about seeing it in front of you and hearing the women and the partners. And I know your husband speaks in the movie. And to me, that was one of the most powerful parts. That interview saved our marriage. I don't doubt that. Yeah. Because it is. And, you know, very often we make the mistake to think that it's a mother's issue. We call it maternal mental health, but it's really a family issue. Yeah. And it's something that impacts every member of the family unit. Yeah. And since the film, I've heard from so many people that want to make a documentary about paternal mental health because fathers suffer too and fathers can get postpartum depression. Right. I smell a sequel. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me, but somebody else should make that. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to take a, a quick commercial break and then come right back and continue the conversation. <laughs> Breast milk is incredibly complex, and it is the gold standard in infant nutrition. In instances when formula is desired or necessary, parents should choose a formula modeled after the key attributes of breast milk. But with so many formula options on the market, how can a parent know? Enter Cabrita, a European goat milk formula modeled after breast milk and made with love and compassion. The Cabrita difference is simple. Gentle goat milk protein combined with good fats and natural carbs. The result is a naturally easy to digest formula designed to maintain the comfort of little ones during feeding transitions, such as weaning, supplementing, or changing formulas due to skin or tummy troubles. Cabrita USA is committed to supporting moms who have made the personal decision to wean or supplement. If you'd like to see if Cabrita is right for your family, order a trial kit at cabritausa.com. That's K-A-B-R-I-T-A USA dot com. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and we're continuing our discussion of postpartum mental health with Dr. Alyssa Berlin and documentary producer Lindsay Lipton Gerst. So we we you've definitely by sharing your story and by producing the film, you've highlighted an area that's been very dark. You've shined the spotlight on an area that's been very dark and under talked about and under treated. And um, it's a move in the right direction. And part of the puzzle pieces that bring it all together are the mental health experts who are now trying to help women and their partners uh, understand what to look for or how to prepare for the postpartum transition. So you, Lindsay, you, you, you had mental health issues from a very young age and you knew about them and you expected postpartum depression. But postpartum depression and other postpartum mental health issues can arise in people who have absolutely no history. And so I know you, Alyssa, have spent years now putting together the afterbirth plan and are trying to somewhat single-handedly help people identify things that they can do during pregnancy to prepare for a smoother transition afterwards. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, Sure. And it has been very much my passion to, whenever possible, prevent people from struggling in the ways that Lindsay has described or in the ways that we know families are really struggling now postpartum. Um, And that was really the thinking behind, you know, the program, the afterbirth plan. Um, You know, for the most part, most people, when they find out they're pregnant, they skip to delivery. And what's that very, very important day going to look like? But we miss the journey of pregnancy. 
Um, and we don't really spend a lot of time planning for afterwards. And, you know, I oftentimes will use that analogy of instead of planning for the wedding, let's think about the marriage. Let's mm-hmm. think about the relationship that's going to ensue, right? So instead of being so focused on Labor Day, let's really think about what that journey into parenthood is going to look like. And it occurred to me that we all make birth plans, right? Most of us have birth plans or birth goals, as they're now being called, but rarely do we make an afterbirth plan. Um, And it's really important and it's really necessary to have that blueprint that can help to navigate that journey. You know, birth is a very static moment, right? There is, as long as it's going to take to get there, there's going to be that one very definitive moment when that baby is born. But pregnant, but parenting is a journey. And to help women and couples and families recognize they don't have to have it all figured out from day one. And if they can just take a step back and give themselves some space to navigate that, it can be a much smoother transition. Um, and, you know, the old adage that, you know, there's no parenting manual, so you just have to kind of jump on in, is actually an antiquated idea. There is so much research now that is out there that can help us plan and prepare for a smoother transition. Um, and that's really what my focus has been, especially um, with an emphasis on the couple, because we know that the nature of the relationship between partners is probably one of the bigger risk factors that will Will, will indicate, you know, if there's going to be a postpartum issue. And you work individually, you work with couples, but then you also do workshops. Yes, I work, right. So whenever possible, I'll work with couples during pregnancy, um, help, you know, usually the structure of the workshop is threefold. The first one is helping people develop accurate expectations for what that transition to parenthood looks like. We're all in a much better place if we know what to expect and can plan accordingly. So although Hallmark does a great job of telling us the fun, cozy parts of what having a baby looks like, we know that there is another side. And we do know that 67% of couples really, um, they struggle and they experience a decline in their relationship satisfaction. And I'm a big believer that anything that almost 70% of the population is doing is normal. And helping to normalize that Mm. with information and education is really powerful. Um, The second part of the workshop really works or speaks to how to help that couple stay connected. You know, when I think about relationships, oftentimes I liken them to walking up a down escalator. And we've all tried that as kids, right? (laughs) Trying to run up that escalator. And we know how much energy it takes to get ahead of that escalator and to prevent it from pulling us down. Um, And in my opinion, that's how, you know, primary relationships work in our lives. It's that moment of constantly working, constantly striving, constantly feeding that relationship so that it doesn't naturally bring us down with the stress and the tension that we all experience in life. Um, And from what I've seen in my practice, having a baby just speeds up that escalator. Oh, yeah. And it requires us to double our efforts to be able to hold on to that primary relationship. And the truth of the matter is what I love about using the analogy of an escalator is that if you think about it, what helps us get ahead is steps, just one step in front of the other. And so for couples to realize it doesn't take anything big or magnanimous to devote and stay connected in that relationship. It's really those baby steps that build up in a nice positive way. And then the last part of the workshop is really aimed at what we've been doing here tonight in terms of educating about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, both for mom and the family, to have that information so everyone can ID it efficiently and appropriately. And so we don't have to lose a lot of wasted time not seeking out the treatment or the help that they need. So destigmatizing it and helping people get to where they need much earlier so that they can get better faster and really enjoy this phase of life. Yeah, and I think stigma is such a huge part in our recovery. You know, we live in a world of social media where everyone posts their pretty pictures online. And, Mm. you know, like people put makeup on after they deliver a baby to take an after picture and they look beautiful. And, you know, it shows this this beautiful moment. And, you know, I can't, you know, say that what they're doing isn't right. It's, It's right for them. But what it does is some of us that have this really awful experience after birth we don't all look like that and right. we want it, we don't want to be seen as you know this unfit mother we want to be seen as having it all together you know especially for the pictures that we get to choose to post right. and and the stigma is so is so huge and i think you know i think people don't want to admit what they're going through and therefore they don't get the help they need soon enough Absolutely. i think social media is like that in general mm-hmm. i mean i i recently said i was lo- trying to lose 30 pounds so i look more like my facebook picture but yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I think that's what happens like you see people post things as if life is so cheery and wonderful yeah, and amazing right. with the greatest language but then you know them personally and you're like wait a second that 
is not the same person. Right. And for me, who, who I'm face blind, when I meet people in person who I've been longtime friends on Facebook with them, I'm like, you know, you know me from Facebook. I'm like, oh, that is not what I expected to <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, see. you don't look like that. Yeah. And it is, that inferiority complex is so deep. You know, it's interesting because I'll work with clients all the time over Skype. Yeah, And every now and again, the room I happen to do it in is also our laundry room. And every now and again, I'm like, oh, should I move the laundry out of the way? And I'm like, you yeah. know what? No, I'm going to leave it because this is real life. This is real life. And yeah. it's exactly. not always easy and it's not always clean and put together. And our laundry is not always put away, literally and figuratively, right? Yeah. And, and what you know, it's like postpartum depression and any form of a perinatal mood disorder, you know, it, it you don't know what the person's going through by what they look like. Right. And I say that in the film while I'm taking my medication. You know, you never know what's going through somebody's head by right. just looking at them. And so I think that it's a scary world we live in, you know, with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, I do it myself, you know, where, like, you take pictures at dinner with friends. And, like, no, I can't post that one because sure. like, I, do, I look better in that one. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, but it's not real. Right. Although I have not yet learned the art of a good selfie. So you'll have to teach me. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's very true. And, and like you said, it's so overwhelming. Overwhelming mm-hmm. and intimidating, um, and and it is challenging. And it's interesting because I was just leading a training this afternoon, um, where you know we were reading this vignette about the mom who loses all her baby weight in those yeah. first couple of weeks, yeah. and how as a society that's something that we congratulate. You're amazing. I can't believe you lost all your body yeah. weight, you, or your pregnancy weight rather. And it's like, why is that something to be happy about? Yeah. And it's something that actually we want to be somewhat concerned about. Anyone who's losing that weight too fast. There's something else going on that we want to be aware of. Right. And also, you know, it's like with, with our Facebook page, the When the Bell Breaks Facebook page and Instagram, I make it kind of like my mission to not post those pretty pictures because, you know, this beautiful mo- – like there was there was this one post that went viral of this mother. She's actually a doula, Kathy. Um, I don't remember her last name. But um, she posted a picture of what postpartum depression looks like with her kids. And the same image, she posted a picture, you know, of what postpartum depression does not look like. And she was all beautiful. You know, and the picture of postpartum depression was her hair is a mess and her clothes are raggy and, you know, like the room's a mess. But in the other picture, the room's beautiful and everything's put together. Mm -hmm. And it shows that this reality is not true. Right. (laughs) You know, it's like I could have a perfectly put together house, you know, like and because I'm OCD, my house is immaculate. I'm sure. Mm. Immaculate. Like, I don't care how bad I am. That house is going to look good. You know, and like I could have my hair done and makeup on and I could could be the worst day I have. Right. You never know. You can't tell. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And you know what? It's interesting because unfortunately or for, uh, whatever it is, but, you know, maternal mental health, it doesn't discriminate. It's Mm-mm. an equal opportunist kind of, you know, experience. So it doesn't matter socioeconomic status, walk of life, anything. And what I love about what you're saying is it's really helping us to learn to not judge mm-hmm. and not to take things at face value. And when there is a new mom who seems to be having it either all together or not, to just slow down and ask those questions, to take that moment and really connect with her and see how she's doing. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I like about connecting with couples and women when during pregnancy, mm-hmm. because it is hard. Like you were saying, you know, here you were having just delivered, going through one of the scariest moments of your life, having to meet a psychiatrist for the first time. Yeah. And I find that that people are much less hesitant to connect and reach out for help if they've met me beforehand and if they're not meeting me for the first time when everything seems to have fallen apart. Yeah. Um, so I like that it offers them that education, which helps to mitigate the experience. Yeah. And in those moments when, you know, postpartum happens, because we know it's not something that gets chosen, but something that happens to us, that it, it just removes another barrier for them to reach out and, and get help or even just check in and say, hey, this is what's going on. What do you think? Is this normal or is, you know, is it something that we need to address? Right. There's a few things when you compare mental health and physical health and you see mental health being under-addressed and, uh, and misunderstood. For example, you know, if you're walking behind somebody who is missing a leg and they're walking slowly, um, you're not going to get upset at them. Sure. You're going to feel compassionate. You're going to feel sad for them but if some, or, or try to help them. If, you, if somebody's in front of you and even if you know they have a mental health issue and certainly if you don't because like you said, Lindsay, you can't tell by looking at somebody, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to – 
you're, you're not going to be patient with them. You're not right. going to be, how can I help you with right. them? And the other thing is during pregnancy, when you go in for your prenatal visits, um, especially in the medical model, we're very focused on the physical. Mm-hmm. How are you doing? How is your growth? How much weight are you gaining? You know, do you have any physical symptoms? What's your blood sugar like? Your blood pressure? We have all these things that we test for on a regular basis. But where is the testing for how are you feeling inside? Right. Um, and it doesn't exist. These little markers that we're looking for are physical. They don't happen on the mental side. And the midwific model, I think it happens a little more. It's a little more holistic. The uh, visits, instead of taking five minutes, take like an hour. And there's a lot of discussion about how you're doing as a whole being. But because of that, and even postnatally, you typically don't see your obstetrician for six weeks. Well, there's a lot that can happen over those six weeks, whereas in the midwific model, they tend to check in on you much more frequently. And And I think like, you know, this leads to how important it is for everyone to be educated, including physicians and OBGYN, every person that deals with Absolutely. Post, you postpartum, the mom postpartum is so important because I, my OBGYN, you know, agreed to induce me knowing that I have a history of depression, anxiety, and OCD, right. you know, like that's not what should have Happened. Right, wouldn't have been my first choice. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I had a very traumatic delivery. Right. Also, six weeks when I went to see her, I was in really bad shape. Mm-hmm. And the first thing she said to me was, you probably need ECT. <laughs> that Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and like, you know, not that there's anything wrong with getting that to get help, but it scared me because I was like, wait, we're going straight to that? Right. And that's it. Well, I mean, we could talk about kind of um, – bedside manner yeah. at another time. Um, but yeah, that, that is, you know, and it's interesting. And, and it's interesting, Ellie, because you said in the beginning that I'm pioneering this by myself. Um, and a little bit I am in the sense that I am working hard to get OBs and midwives alike to start making 28 weeks, that postpartum mm-hmm. check-in week, mm-hmm. where they mandate as just part of their natural care, do a preparation for, you know, parenting class. Everyone's recommending, you know, preparing for childbirth, which is important. But I think that for us to really change the climate and to remove some of that stigma, it needs to be part of mainstream. Standard. Everyone does it. A little mental health checkup. Right. And and some of them are coming on board with that, which is sort of nice to see. And it has. It's been a very positive response Mm -hmm. because I am finding of late that a a number of the OBs and the the, um, midwives that I work with are recognizing the problem yes. and they're at a loss for what to do and they're seeing the need for prevention and preparation. Well, yeah, and that's why this conversation can never, ever, ever end or slow down because not only there is the need to educate, but there's so much to it because like more and more doctors can start screening for postpartum depression mm-hmm. and, you know, or perinatal mood disorder. But the mother has to be honest right. with the questions. Mm-hmm. And in order for her to be honest, she can't worry about the stigma attached to it. Sure. The amount of women I hear from that say, I, I did the screening. You know, I, I, I checked and everything. And even endorsed something, right? Uh-huh. And I lied because mm-hmm. I didn't want the doctor to take away my baby. Right. And that's it. That's right. And that fear of being labeled as crazy or that fear Mm -hmm. of the repercussions, it is. It's huge. And that's why I think it's important that it also can't be a static one moment. Like when we talk about screening, screening has to be something that's happening throughout pregnancy and throughout that postpartum period because it takes time to build that relationship and that sense of safety and that rapport. Mm -hmm. And even though they may not endorse it that first time, you know, trust your gut. And if it sounds like something's going on, keep talking. Yes. Keep that conversation yeah. going. And don't, if, if you see a mom struggling and she says she's okay, if you have any, you know, like glimpse that something's not right, keep on her. Keep on her. And the opposite is also true because I've heard a number of stories from women who say, I did fill out that screener and I did endorse there was a problem, but no one ever asked me yeah. about it and nothing happened. And I think that oftentimes it comes from a loss that, you know, medical professionals are like, oh, gosh, well, now I don't know what to do. Right. So we do. We need to continue to work together so that yeah. they have the resources, yeah. you know, available to address that. Yeah. Well, and, a, can, oh, yeah, please. Can you give me some information? Because uh, for listeners at home, uh, there's a whole lot that can happen postpartum emotionally, mm-hmm. right? Some of it is is pretty typical and to, sort of to be expected sure. and not all that concerning, but it, it feels different. And some of it is more concerning and needs to be addressed. So how do, what signs do you look for for what's normal baby blues versus something more in, 
interns. Yeah, and I'm glad that you asked because, you know, back in the day, there was no distinction and anything, any struggles that a woman had after pregnancy or after giving birth was considered pathological. And we now know that that's not the case, that there is a distinction between the blues and postpartum, you know, related illnesses. Um, Usually two to three days after a woman has a baby for up to two to three weeks, that is the baby blue period. Um, And typically, You know, what we see is that a woman may feel moody. She may be irritable, crying for no reason. A lot of times you'll hear women say that they just don't feel grounded. They don't feel like they're themselves. Um, They feel like they're all over the place. Um, And that's very normal. You know, it does take time for your body to recalibrate back to its pre-pregnancy hormonal level. Um, A mom is also getting used to a very new phase of life and, and feeling overwhelmed can be a big part of that. Um, The nice thing about the blues is that it doesn't really require professional treatment. It is something that will typically pass on its own. Um, Things that people can do to just facilitate a more, you know, therapeutic environment um, include talking to people, right, making sure that they're getting that social support. So a lot of times I'll tell partners, you know, it's their job to listen to their wives' stories like they've never heard it before, like they didn't actually have front row seats for that event. But if mom wants to talk, you need to listen. Um, because listening is a very cathartic experience. We also know that anything that you'll do to take care of your physical self will really speak to your emotional self. And so, so often we're, we're quick to put our needs aside, especially in this phase of life, but we can't. It's really important. And one of the best analogies that I heard was, you know, when you unwrap a candy, you throw out the wrapper. And it's like when that baby is born, we kind of put mom to the side or mom feels like her needs are no longer important and it should be all about baby. And that is a pivotal mistake that everyone will pay for. So we want to keep that self-care going and address mom's physical needs. So anything you do to take care of your physical self will help your emotional self. Um, Eating healthy food, exercising as doctor approved, even just going outside and getting some fresh air can do a lot to change a mother's mood. Um, we talked about talking. I'm also a big proponent of touch. Nothing signals to a new mom that she's not alone more than touch. And if your partner happens to not be the touchy-feely kind, great, get a massage, mm-hmm. right? Touch is just a valuable, valuable experience for us as human beings. When we segue past that two- to three-week mark, that's when we're looking at symptoms, if not a full-blown disorder, whether depressed or anxiety um, or the gamut that we had talked about. Um, And oftentimes, you know, you'll hear women say that they feel hopeless, they feel overwhelmed, um, they feel like they're on a roller coaster, they feel like they're numb and going through the motions. Um, Sometimes you'll hear women say things like they think that, you know, perhaps this baby would have been better off with a different mom. Um, Or you'll hear more of that anxious side of it come out where I can't hold the baby, I don't want to touch the baby, you do it. Or the mom who feels like it has to all be her. So there's lots and lots of different things that can happen. Um, About 20% of women will experience a full-blown postpartum depression typically. Um, And when it does hit that threshold of being a full-on disorder, it requires professional treatment. It's important for women to recognize, and as we were talking about destigmatizing, there's nothing that they did that caused this to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's not if they had birthed differently or made different choices, then it it would have come out differently. They didn't choose this. For whatever reason, this is how their bodies are reacting to this phase of life, to the changes in hormones and the feeling overwhelmed and just adjusting. And because it's not something that they willed or made happen, they can't will it to go away. It does require professional help. But the good news is, is that for the most part, more typical cases of postpartum depression or anxiety really do respond very well to treatment. What kind of treatments? So treatment usually... um, will include some kind of psychotherapy, um, interpersonal therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical are all great modalities that are very effective. And as we were talking about before, when warranted, medication can be a tremendous piece of that puzzle. And I've seen for countless women where therapy was enough to get them back on their feet and enjoying that cute little baby. And I've seen for just as many other women where that medication was that really important piece of the puzzle that made all the difference. Um, And there are a number of holistic things and natural things that have worked also. And I know, Lindsay, you've tried a whole bunch of them. Oh, yeah. But acupuncture can be great. Hypnotherapy can Mm -hmm. be great. 
Um, I still do acupuncture, and and once a week I get massage therapy with acupuncture and cupping just to for that release and to feel good for that moment even. Sure. Mm-hmm. Relaxation. And that's it, and we don't want to minimize those mm-hmm. moments. Um, and touch, right? I, I, I'm a big proponent, and I'm glad to hear that you're still getting those massages. Yeah. Because it is. It's a big part of the experience. And then there's those newer treatments like TMS. Yes. Right. Yeah. That, which I tried as well and show in the film. Do you want to talk more about that? I, I don't use TMS as much. Yeah, no, I just there there's so many I just uh there's so many options. Yes. The the point is to to not give up if something doesn't work. There's and so that's many it. things you can do. Um EMDR and medication is what ultimately worked for me. That's incredible. And EMDR, right? You know, um eye movement desensitization mm-hmm. is tremendous. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes it is a treatment of choice for trauma. Mm-hmm. And exactly. Can just target it from a very different perspective. So I'm glad that that was effective for you. Yeah. And it is. It's a w- wonderful proponent that out there. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on why, I mean, 20% seems like a large number for for pathological, for mental health illness, right? Sure. Um, earlier you said, you know, 70% of a society is doing something, then it must be the norm. But 20% is a big chunk. It is. Are there things about our society now that make us more susceptible? Yeah, one of the biggest components, I think, is just looking at how transient we are. First of all, let's talk about the amount of stress and the nature of society to go, 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 right? We're under such a huge amount of stress and the expectation that you pop that baby out and six weeks later you're meant to go back to work. So that in and of itself is tremendous and daunting, right? You're still not even sleeping through the night, yet you're supposed to somehow function all day and be you know, a contributing member to society and then come home and take care of that baby all day and all night. So that's overwhelming. But especially when you couple that with the fact that we've really lost our village, we've lost the family connection and, and the family support. I don't believe any of us were meant to do it on our own. We were meant to have the support of family, well-meaning aunts, uncles, neighbors, you know, a team to really help us to, t- to take care of that one baby. Um, and we don't have that anymore. Even the grocer, the, the town grocer. Absolutely. Yeah. There are you know, cultures that have that village, and the percentage is so much lower than what we have. Tremendously. You know, and it's like, you know, now, you know, like families are all across the country or, you know, and, and so right. we don't have that. And for me, I just wrote a piece on the village. You know, I had to form my own village. Yes. So you're all alone. You don't have your family nearby. You, you know, your friends have disappeared because they're afraid of you and, you know, don't want to be around sadness all the time. Right. And so what do you do? You don't stop. You find your own village. That's right. You create it. <laughs> and I'm with you. And it's one, some, one of the things that we do in the, you know, in the afterbirth plan mm-hmm. is helping people to start a master their village. So I created a document. It's this two-page document with everything you need to know for that postpartum period, including who are you going to connect with for mm-hmm. lactation support, mommy and me groups, you know, postpartum support, yes. food, right? Get that local grocer on the list. Yes. Um, great apps that are out there that can bring things to you without you having to go out and do it. So I'm with you. Even though we lost the village of yesteryear, yeah. it doesn't mean that we just sit and we struggle, right. but we put it together. Right. I think the biggest thing is you don't give up. You keep going. And That's right. You, you find what works for you and you find your people. And-, and you're a clear testament to that. And to this day, I mean, we, Ellie and I, You know, we don't live near family. We live in L.A. and everyone in our family is back on the East Coast. Um, And I remember to this day, you know, one of, you know, some of the hardest moments would be when the baby would be sleeping, but the two-year-old needed to be picked up. And you're kind of in that moment thinking, like, who am I going to sacrifice in this moment? And it was one of those things that I took on to do for friends when I could, as my kids got older, of stay home with the baby. I could bring you your two-year-old. Because it is, it's those challenging moments of how do you divide yourself into so many different pieces. Yeah. Um, but to be able to call in a neighbor and say, hey, can you grab so-and-so for me? Yeah. It's life-changing. And also now, things have become, you know, to us, like, so much easier. Like, I feel overwhelmed doing everything in the day that I – it gives me anxiety to go to the grocery store. Now they have Instacart or Amazon Absolutely. delivery. You know, it's like, what do you choose to spend your money on? I choose to spend it on that delivery fee. For sure. Mm-hmm. Because that's what helps me today. 
Well, you're talking to an app junkie here. Oh, yeah, because I, Ellie, I, I use every app for everything. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and he has hooked us up, but it's true. And yeah. I'll tell couples that all the time that I know it feels like a lot of money up front. And for some, it's hard because they don't have the resources to put to it. For the ones that do, I say, listen, I promise you by the time those kids are going to college, you're not going to still be paying for these things. Right. So it's, you know, finances up front will have a long payoff down the road. And I tell the ones who don't have the wherewithal that every time a baby is born, they come with two new best friends, and that's creativity and flexibility. Yeah. And how do we still work the system? And so maybe we don't have the money to pay for the babysitter, but maybe there's a neighbor nearby, and we can swap, and we can take turns. And by the way, what an amazing after-delivery present, better than baby clothes or another bottle warmer. Get them a doula for the night. Absolutely. Ooh, right? yeah. Yes. If, like, if you take nothing else out of this podcast, yes, that is that. the take home <laughs> message. All right. I, I was going to talk about, but it looks like we'll have to do a whole other episode on the non birthing partner mm-hmm. and postpartum men- mental health dads and partners. Um, I really am so grateful to both of you for being here. Lindsay, where can we find you online? I feel like you're just warming up on your journey here. Um, yeah, I'm very passionate about this, and I'm so grateful to be with both of you who are so knowledgeable, and I love you, Alyssa. You're just like in my heart. Hey, I know how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were sitting next to me when the film premiered, so it, um, you're very special to me. But um, yeah, I am, you know, th- this is something that I'm not going to stop. This is something that, I, unfortunately, I went through, and I just... You know, I'm available for anybody that needs to talk. You will find me on our Facebook page, When the Bell Breaks, a documentary about postpartum depression. Um, There are some copy sites, so just make sure it's the correct one. Um, And if you private message, it's me that will get back to you. And I also, you know, there's so many organizations that I can connect you with that can help you. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I'm always around to talk and I'm always going to speak out about it. You know, it, it's we talked about this earlier, how important it is, you know, like th- this is th- there's a reason why we go through these things and there's a reason why we suffer. And it's to educate and teach. And at the end of the day, you know, this this film is what saved me. So I hope that, you know, if you're struggling, you know, just know that there are trigger warnings in the film, but it will educate you and it will help you, you know, know that you're not alone. And I'm always around um, to talk to Thank you. And Alyssa, where do we find you online? Sure. And, and I think it's serendipitous, Lindsay, you know, that I happen to sit next to you for the documentary yeah. premiere. And I feel like it did. It bonded us forever. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm very, I feel very honored and humbled to have Thank that you. connection with you. Um, you can find me online, www.drberlin.com, um, as well as the afterbirthplan.com. Um, and please feel free to reach out. I do, you know, I work with people online, over the computer, in person, whatever you need. I want to make sure that you have access to that information and really just help you to have an easier and smoother journey into parenthood. Thank you. Thank Thank you you for having me so much. And uh, at home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Uh, Visit us online for lots more pregnancy and parenting media at informedpregnancy.com. I got a-